I am terrible at staying still, so. <laughs> uh, seems like uh, it's the bane of Isaac that I always get to talk after a really amazing presentation. So uh, my fingers are just a little bit shaky. <clears throat> so welcome to my talk, Onion and Swiss Cheese, Security Revisited. My name is Jerry Cott. I have been a small talker for about 26, 27 years. And um, like uh, that uh, young fellow who just started the gym talk, it was, I always like to say, it was a three day thing. First day, what? Second day, this is interesting. Third day, I never want to use anything else again. So that's my story. We can end here. <laughs> Um, so the, um, the security talk is always kind of tricky to do because a lot of people think of security as something technical. And uh, I have learned over the years that the technical side is really only a small part of it. So uh, most of what you will hear and see is unusual, maybe. Oh, Ooh. what? Okay, I'm sorry. You may remember this slide from last year if you saw my talk. Um, two different castles, one with good security, one with bad security. We see the results, right? And if you saw my talk last year, you may also remember a question. What is CIA? So this is a quiz for the audience. What is CIA? Well, in security, that's not what CIA means at all. In security, in information security, what the CIA is, is the three pillars of information security confidentiality, integrity, and availability of data. And um, I will ask this question again next year if I come. So write it down. <clears throat> so here we go. I said it's going to be different. So this is the big, big picture. In the 1980s, this is the map of Europe. And many people here will remember that. Uh, you will see the big red thing. That's where I come from, somewhere there. This is where the computers were. There is a big wall between, well, actually, it was more like a uh, um, long fence with electric wires and stuff. Not a good thing to try to walk through. OK. This is 1981, my first computer. It's a programmable calculator I got as a gift from my father for graduating from high school and being accepted to university. It had 38 programming steps, um, seven memory registers, and first year, three years of university, this was the horsework for uh, the workhorse. I keep doing that, sorry, I'm never gonna get away. Okay. <clears throat> in 1983, while working in a physics lab, I heard some beeping from a room from next to the door, and I went to see this computer that you can see here has the IQ 151. Um, it was the first school mini microcomputer in Czechoslovakia and IQ 151 is something you needed to make it work without crashing. <coughs> Couple of years later, um, this is PMD 85 uh, made by the other Tesla. Uh, that was the Czech state company making all electronics um, as every Monopoly, it was just mediocre, which the PMD ultimately stands for. Pretty mediocre machine. Oh, sorry, pretty mediocre device. 
So we are still where we were three, four years ago. And then I realized I have some channels through that wired fence. And in 1986, I got my first computer that worked. It was the Spectrum. Uh, there was a gentleman from South Africa yesterday. Uh, it was an awesome machine. This is how you hook it up. That's the external memory. It has, uh, it used uh, tape, you know, audio cassettes. I'm sure some people remember that. Uh, it had 48K RAM and it was awesome. But I didn't want to play games like most people did. I wanted to program. So the next thing I did was get myself a printer, Atari printer. Uh, there was a slight problem. Can you see the problem? Well, these two interfaces don't look very compatible, do they? Well, what do you do when you get something that doesn't fit? You go and take it back to the store, right? Wow, here is a slight problem. So, no. So instead, I learned that then they did assembler, soldered some components together with a big help from some um, student friends in electronics. I reverse engineered the whole thing, wrote my own driver, and about six months later, I was able to print my first program. <clears throat> so, seven years later, or eight years later, we are still here. I used those channels and decided, you know what? I want a real computer. So, through some uh, what I later learned to be social engineering. Uh, I managed to get a three-day visa to visit West Berlin. This is me in front of the Berlin Wall on the west, western side without computer, with a computer. So uh, my first computer it was PC incompatible, had 256K RAM, dual floppy disk, awesome. Cost about two years worth of my salary at the time after I graduated from university. And of course, um, computers in the East Block back then were a little bit of a cult and underground movement. So with that comes bootleg software. This is Smalltalk V in the 19, it's the 1986 version, and it's pretty much what I first saw in late 1988. And I thought it was interesting. <clears throat> and life is great. And meanwhile, we still have this map. Well, it just happened, I don't know if. This will work. Oh, let's see if we can do it again. Quick, quick. Mr. Gorbachev. Tear down this wall. <laughs> well, guess what? This is how the East Germany replied. The wall will be here in 100 years. And of course, the East German um, population was you know, compelled to go out in streets and show off their computer technology. <laughs> in Czechoslovakia, in the meantime, uh, people were really encouraged by what Gorbachev said about uh, 
Reagan said and Gorbachev's reaction to that. So they went to streets and said, we want something different. And uh, this is the security part of it. And here we are finally coming to why this is relevant to security talk. Uh, of course, uh, in January 1989, that uh, kind of um, escalated and it was the time where I decided that I wanted out through that barbed wire with 200 kilovolts in it. But by the summer of 89, I actually managed to escape and uh, ended up in Austria, which uh, you can see is very close, right? Except I went this way, like several borders, several um, events like getting robbed in Rome and uh, if you want to hear the full story, see me for beer later. Um, so, but four months later, the Berlin Wall that was meant to last 100 years was the Velvet Revolution happened in Czechoslovakia and Soviet communism in Eastern Europe collapsed. So, fast forward 30 years and the geopolitical landscape is somewhat different, not too much. Uh, it really looks more like this. I don't know if the if the internet is on. Let's see. Oh, so didn't work. Um, pop, 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 pop. Come on. Come on. This is what happens when you have automated things. So. Back to this slide. Um, this is a screenshot from FireEye Cyber Threat Map. It's a real, real time uh, thing, and it really—if you actually click that link, and uh, you can—the uh, the presentation will be online. Uh, you can see um, FireEye and other security companies have sensors around the world, and they monitor all the malware traffic or the known malware traffic and you can watch in uh, real time that really the geopolitics of today is everybody against everybody else. The point is geopolitics do shape careers. It certainly shaped mine. Motivation matters. If I didn't spend six months reverse engineering that ZX Spectrum thing, I probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> uh, hackers, which I kind of count myself as one, as an ethical hacker, I didn't know that that was the thing when I was hacking those computers. But uh, they go where the action go, where, where the action is, where there is hardware, software, data. Hackers go after that. It's always good to look at things from the other side. Again, if I didn't managed to visit West Berlin, um, my worldview would probably be quite different. <clears throat> Even the most powerful systems, which includes nation states, are vulnerable to attacks. Reality doesn't care about what you think about it or wish. Reality is just is. And a den denial of a problem will not make that problem go away. That's what Eric Honecker and his comrades in the Eastern German Politburo learned. And uh, perhaps most important phrase in human history is to realize and to be able to say, I don't know, because that's the beginning of a path to learning. So uh, here are some hackers best friends and that's the technical stuff. That's if you want to learn the craft. Yeah. What our real hackers best friends are imagination, creativity, perseverance, ignorance of the adversaries and gullibility. You know, people just still click those links. You know, they don't think about what's on the other side. 
Um, so we are finally getting, I mean, how much time do I have? <laughs> um, uh, so uh, the metaphors in security, and it's not just cybersecurity, is uh, that security works in layers, right? And always the best stuff is at the center. And um, Swiss cheese it means there are holes and bubbles and there are vulnerability. And if you slice it right, you can just walk through the bubbles to the other side. Now, these are, these are just approximations that are quite useful, but not quite accurate. So you always have to think about it as any other analogy, right? It just makes you kind of picture the whole thing, but it's not the thing. So uh, to understand security, we need to understand risk. And it has a complicated description, but really what it means is understand behaviors. What things are, are what they do. I think Dave West mentioned it the other day. Um, so, if we understand the behavior of the threats and the assets, we get a much better idea about what the risks are that we are facing. And um, to understand behavior, we, of course, you know, it doesn't come for free, right? So we need to study and analyze the past and you know, imagine how it translates into future. So here I have a little exercise. And I'm sorry, I really have no time. Oh, I do have. So uh, here is an airport. What do you see most of? Open space, grass. Well, it turns out that somebody thought it would be a good idea to have the grass grow to cut it and feed the livestock. Except what happens next is that the wild animals move in and all the birds, all the birds of prey starts flying over the airport. So what do they do? fire flares at the birds. Of course, they miss most of the time, which means that the flares end up in the grass. What happens next? The grass burns. So instead of uh, making some money on, on uh, uh, grass crop, they spend a whole lot of money on firefighting, which leads us to a failure of imagination. And uh, I have a bunch of flies here. Oh, failure of imagination, what it is. Um, and, you know, this is like stuff you can find online. Uh, it's best described by some thinking. This would never happen here. I don't need security. I have nothing to hide, that sort of thing. Um, so, would you think this is a failure of imagination? How about this one? How about this one? That's my favorite failure of imagination. Now, uh, uh, last year I talked about the fence in that, and here is where we kind of see the onion, right? And um, at every level, every boundary, we just need to assume breach. What will happen if something happens at this boundary? In reality, it's not like onion, it's more like foam, you know, like bubbles within bubbles within bubbles kind of thing, right? And one of these bubbles is your small talk application. Um, so let's talk about some imaginary scenario. We have a small talk, web, small talk based web app as front end web server, Apache with reverse proxy. Everybody knows what these mean. Yeah, okay. Uh, we have Seaside app at the back end, Gemstone database. We have some store code repository. What could go wrong? Well, what if the web server is misconfigured? What if it allows somebody to just start inserting dot dot and you know kind of navigate the tree, right? What if somebody uploads a PHP web shell or a reverse shell launcher? Right. These are very common vulnerabilities out in the wild, and they are like different variations of it. 
and uh, they are one of the most common ways of hackers getting in. So, as I said, assume breach. Assume that this has or may happen. So, uh, let's follow the, this line of thought. We have a compromised host. We have a reverse shell with a hacker at the other side of it. And he has a, or she, like that lady in Seattle a few weeks ago, uh, has a remote access to the target host command line. What will an attacker do? What's the attacker's behavior? Let's think about it because we don't have time really to go back and forth, although I would love it. So um, the first thing, um, an offensive security professional is taught is when you get a shell, you need to learn about it. What's the system? What's the user ID that you compromised? Uh, what's the network information? What are the processes? Do we have any open connections? Uh, whether listeners or connections to other hosts? Um, do we have ways to move to other systems from where we are now? And what are the file stats? That's the, that's the food, right? So, are the files small talk images? Probably, if there is small talk, right? So, uh, we have images, and of course, being in an image-based system, we have application and data in one file, which makes it really cool for development. But it also makes it very, I, I won't say vulnerable, but um, appealing to, to exploit, okay? So in the application, we have the domain behavior, we have the UI behavior, we have some you know, ways to communicate, right? We have the tools, and then we have the data, the transient objects which come and go, and we have the persistent objects, things like passwords. Database and repository credentials, seaside configurations. Um, I would say this is the stuff that is not normally taught in um, offensive security courses. But I believe, having met few hackers, that it is a mere inconvenience because if they are any good, they know that they don't know. They will say, I don't know, let me find out. And this is just a little blip on their, on their way, okay? So we have other small talk artifacts. Changes files, we know what they contain, the entire history of what you did in your workspace, in whatever, right? In your compiled code, configuration files, log files, and so on. I, I think I pressed the wrong button. So in our imaginary scenario, now we have a shell and we know that we are on Linux. Uh, the user ID is www-data, which is normally what the web server runs with. Uh, here is our, uh, our uh, current path. But then we also see that we have a bunch of processes with small talk images. And we see some ports here. So does anybody see anything familiar here? Yes? What do we see? So right, so we see Postgres. What could that be? A connection to store. We see this. Connection to gemstone. We see this. Seaside, we see this, we can see, we see port 80, we don't see port 443, even though we may have come through a secure host. What does it mean? Exactly, reverse proxy. So, um, you know, these are the things that hackers look for. And these are usually the first things they find. Then they go to, you know, do some file enumeration, and then they find, 500 scripts that are used for whatever, and they all have hard-coded credentials in them. Yummy. All right, um, an alternative 
is that you are on Windows 7 where the situation is even more interesting because the IUSR and I think there are some variations so that I'm not really big Windows user for some strange reason. Um, but um, they, they are even more vulnerable, right? Never mind that Windows often run on um, unpatched systems and so on. Um, maybe one port here, 3389, what would that be? Remote desktop, correct. Uh, what about this port here? Connected to port 4800. It's the port for NV code repository. So that means whatever you are running is probably, yeah. Um, okay, so we have a lot of information. We can start expanding the reach and so on. Um, not that much interested until we get here. So this is a real site that I showed last year. It's authenticated, although it's HTTP, not S. And you have this. So what's the problem here? Out of the three pillars, CIA, what can you see compromised? All three of them on a single page. It reveals confidential information that should be only known to the company, right? Uh, saving the image can change the state of the application, so your integrity goes out of the window. And uh, if you clear sessions or save and quit, quit up without saving, the availability is gone. So, few tips. Don't hard code credentials in scripts, ever. Use, don't use default credentials. How many people here run a production gemstone database and you don't have to answer and you still use data, creator, and sortfish, right? Don't think that just because your application is not that important that it cannot be a target. Imagine it will. And some do's. Um, imagine what would Jerry do, yeah, okay. It's, oh, okay, let's take that. Uh, wipe credentials right out immediately after, the, after use. When your user logs in, you don't need that information anymore, right? Wipe it out of memory. Have an incident response plan. This is more on the corporate IT side of things. Do vulnerability assessment and penetration tests and hire someone who knows what they are doing and understands small dog. And that's it. Wow. Thank you very much. <laughs>